Chapter Three of the Phantom Town Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Phantom Town Mystery by Carol Norton. Chapter Three The Missing Friends. Upstairs, in Mary's room, which was furnished as it had been when she had been there as a child, curly maple set with blue hangings, the two girls changed from riding habits to house dresses. Mary wore a softly clinging blue, while Dora donned her favorite and most becoming cherry color. "'One might think that we are expecting company to-night.' Mary was peering into the oval glass as she spoke, arranging her fascinating golden curls above small shell-like ears. "'Which, of course, we are not.' Dora had brushed her black bob, boy-fashion, slick to her head. "'There being no near neighbors to drop in.' Then suddenly she exclaimed, "'Oh, for goodness sakes alive! I completely forgot that letter. It's for both of us, from Polly and Patsy. I've been wondering why they didn't write and tell us where they had decided to spend their summer vacation.' Dora sprang up to search for the letter in a pocket of her writing habit. Mary sat near a window in a curly maple rocker, as she said dreamily, "'If we hadn't come west, we would have been with them, that is, if they went to Camp Winnichook up in the Adirondacks the way we had planned all winter.' Dora, holding the letter unopened, sat near her friend and smiled at her reminiscently as she said, "'We plan and plan and plan for the future, don't we? And then we do something exactly different, and most unexpected.' but I wouldn't give up being out here on the desert and living in a ghost town for all the fun Patsy and Polly may be having." Mary laughingly interrupted, "'Do read the letter, and let's see if they really did go there. Perhaps—' "'Yes, they did.' Dora had unfolded a large, boyish-looking sheet of paper. "'Camp Winnichook,' she announced. Then she read the rather indolent scrawl. "'Dear Cowgirls,' it began. Patsy has just come in from a swim. She's drying her bathing suit by lying on the sand in front of the cabin in the sun. Her red hair, which she calls a wind-blown mop, looks at present like a mop that has just finished doing the kitchen floor. Last winter, you recall, she had a few red freckles on her saucy pug nose, but now she wears them all over her face, and arms, and even on her back. She's a sight to behold. There were spatters on the paper that might have been water. The type of penmanship changed. A jerky, uneven handwriting seemed to ejaculate indignantly. "'Don't you kids believe a word of it. I'm a dazzling beauty, as ever. It's Polly whose looks are ruined, if she ever had any. She won't play tennis, and she won't swim, and she will eat chocolate drops, you know the finish, and she wasn't any too slim last year when she had to do Jim.' The first penmanship took up the tale. I had to forcibly push Patsy away. She's gone in to dress now, so I'll hurry and get this letter into an envelope, and sealed, before she gets back, because I want to tell on her. You know Pat has always said she was a boy-hater, and the more the boys from Wales Military Academy rushed her, the more she would shrug her shoulders and poof about them. But she's met her Waterloo. There's a flying field near our camp, and a boy named Harry Hulbert is there studying to be a pilot. Pat and I strolled over to the field one day, and ever since she caught sight of that tall, slim chap all done up in his flying togs, she's been wild to meet him. I wouldn't be surprised if she's even hoping that his machine will crash some day, right in front of our cabin, so that she can bind up his wounds and— Once again the jerky, uneven writing seemed to exclaim, "'Silly gilly, that's what Polly is. It isn't the flyer, it's the flying that I'm crazy about.' I do wish I knew that Harry Hulbert, but not for any sentimental reasons, believe me. Poof, for all of them. But fly I'm going to. In truth, if you girls stay west until the end of vacation, you may see an airplane landing in your ghost town. Me piloting. Then came a wide space, and when the writing began again it was dated three days later and was Polly's lazy scrawl. It's to laugh, she began, but to explain. If you wish hard enough for anything, it's bound to happen. Not that Harry Hulbert's plane crashed in front of our cabin, but it was forced down when Patsy and I were out in her little green car far from human habitation. 
Of course we hadn't gone riding just because we saw that particular little silver plane practicing up in the air. Oh, no, not at all. Patsy's jerky scribble interrupted. She's a mean, horrid, misrepresenting person, Polly Perkins is. She knows perfectly well we had to go to the village to get a pound of butter for our camp mother. And wasn't it only polite for us to give that poor stranded boy a lift? He is a real decent sort, even though the only thing he's crazy about is flying. But we did learn something about him. His father has some sort of a government position in Arizona, where you are, no less. I mean, in the same state. And when Harry gets his pilot's license, he is to be a flying scout, he told us. He said it will be an awfully exciting life. When there has been a hold-up out there, on a stage or train, and the bandits leap on to their horses and flee across the border, Harry is to pursue them in his little silver plane and see where they go. Then he'll circle back to where a posse is waiting, notify them, and so the bandits will be captured. Won't that be simply too thrilling for words? Oh, why wasn't I born a boy? I could have been Patrick, then, instead of Patsy. Believe me, when Harry Hulbert gets his license, and it won't be long now, he's that good. Don't I wish I could be a stowaway in his plane? We'd have to leave Polly here, though. She's so heavy, the plane wouldn't be able to get off the ground. The lazy scrawl concluded the epistle. If Patsy goes west, so do I. But I'll go by train. I have no romantic urge to take to the air with slim, goggle-eyed young men with a purpose in life. Our camp-mother, nice Mrs. Higgins, Jane's aunt, came with us this year, is calling us to lunch, and right after that Pat and I are going to town to mail this. Pat wants me to say that when her friend, Mr. Harry Hulbert, does fly west, she'll give him a letter of introduction to you two, and I calls that right generous of her considering— Poof! came a brief interruption. Then, good-bye. We're signing off. Patsy Ordell and Polly Perkins of the famous Sunnybank Seminary Quadrilettes. What a jolly letter, Mary said. Wouldn't it be fun if the missing members of our little clan could be here with us? Patsy is as wild about mystery stories as you are, and this ghost town just teems with them. A rich musical voice drifted up from the back porch. Senoritas! Oh, good! There's Carmelita, calling us to supper. And am I hungry? Dora tossed the letter on the dresser, and slipping an arm about her friend, she gave her a little impulsive hug. I don't envy Pat and Paul, not the least little mite, she said, as they went down the broad front stairway together. It is lovely at Camp Winnichook, as we well know, since we've been there with them the past three summers. But the desert has a lure for me that the little blue lake in the mountains never did have. I know, Mary agreed. Those mountains are more like pretty hills. There's nothing grim or grand about them. They entered a large, pleasant kitchen, in one corner of which, between two windows, was a table spread with a red cloth. A good-looking middle-aged Mexican woman, dressed in bright colors, stood at the stove preparing to dish up their meal. "'Buenos dias, niñas,' she said in her deep musical voice. "'Good evening, Carmelita,' the girls replied, and then, when they had been served generous portions of the Americanized Mexican dish which the girls called tamale pie, Dora flashed at the smiling cook a pleased glance, as she said, "'Muchas gracias, senora.' Then to Mary, "'It doesn't take long to use up all the Spanish I know. Let's take a vow that when we go back to Sunnybank Seminary next fall we will add Spanish to—' A wistful expression in her friend's face caused Dora to pause and exclaim in real alarm, "'Mary Moore, do you think, because of your dad, that you won't be able to go back east to school? You have only one year more before you graduate. You know how we four of the quadrillettes have counted on graduating together.' Mary smiled brightly. "'Of course I expect to go and take Dad with me.' Her momentary wistful doubting had passed. They had finished their supper, and were rising when Carmelita, who had been out on the back porch, hurried in and began a rapid chattering in her own language. The mystified girls could not understand one word, but as the Mexican woman kept pointing out toward the road, they felt sure that someone was coming toward the house, nor were they wrong. End of chapter 3 Recording by Bill Borst